So we're going to deal with the calendar, everyone's favourite subject. Um, yeah, uh, last time when I was going through it, I, I, I'd said, Yehovah showed me this information. And I think that that was one of the, one of the things that people took umbrage with, basically. And I didn't say it in order to convince anybody of anything. It's not like, Yehovah showed me this. And people said things like, everyone always says that Yehovah showed them the right calendar. And it's like, well, yes, maybe they do. Maybe people always ascribe when they've come to some kind of understanding, they say that Yehovah has shown them it. But that's not the same thing at all. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, Yehovah showed me a new calendar that is the calendar that matches the Bible. Uh, they're two completely different things. And the reason that I said it wasn't to convince anyone of anything or for it to be a big deal. The reason I said it was to ascribe it to Yehovah so that it wasn't understood as, this is JP's calendar, not my calendar. It said exactly what happened, exactly how it, uh, the information was revealed. That's just the way that it was. That's why I said it. It's not meant to be some kind of uh, thing to convince people or anything. So with that out of the way, people have asked, you know, what, what about this element of this calendar? This calendar is right. This calendar is perfect. Um, you know, what, what is the problem with these calendars, basically? Why not just follow the Jewish calendar? Yeshua was following the Jewish calendar. Um, my thoughts, my own personal thoughts on why Yeshua wasn't so concerned with what calendar was going on on the earth is for the same reason that he could be offered with blemishes because he wasn't offered in the earthly tabernacle. He was offered in the heavenly tabernacle and just like Yom Kippur is gonna be fulfilled in the future, he, he didn't even ascend to his father for days after he was killed. You know, for a long period of time after he was killed, that's when he went to heaven to serve as priest and could fulfill those things in the heavenly realm. So I'd, I personally think that's why the calendar that was being followed on the earth wasn't such a big issue. I think that's why it calls it the feasts of the Jews. Personally, that's what I think. I don't know whether that's correct at all, but just on that point. But as to the other calendars, the reason why it is not something that we can follow is because there is one problem which is inherent in every single calendar that there is. Okay. So what is this problem? This, this problem is, it's a fancy word that makes it sound like people know what they're talking about. And it, it's almost like it adds some kind of credibility to the calendar that, oh yes, the calendar works if you do this thing. And this word is, <laughs> intercalation. Sounds good, doesn't it? Makes it sound like it's a legitimate calendar. Oh yes. Our calendar, the, uh, the form of intercalation in our calendar is, is this. Obviously, calendars need intercalation. What intercalation actually means is our calendar doesn't work. But instead of just letting it go, we're going to fudge it. We're going to add this in, or we're going to add that in. And if, if you add in a 13th month, then you can use the moon for months. Brilliant. We'll just add in a 13th month then. And then the calendar is perfect. Or we'll add in a day every year. And then the calendar is perfect. You just need to intercalate. Now, what it means is the calendar doesn't work. If you ever hear anyone using this word, what they're directly telling you is, this calendar's rubbish. Don't, don't listen to anything I say. So intercalation, lunar months, such as on the traditional Jewish calendar, mean you need to add the 13th month on arbitrarily decided upon in leap years. Leap years are not found in the Bible. The Enoch calendar and the Zadok calendar both add in an arbitrarily decided upon day. The Enoch calendar arbitrarily dictates a pattern of two 30-day months Followed by a third 31 day month, this gives a year of 364 days. And the Enoch calendar is very similar. 
it should be a red flag when you say our calendar has a year of 364 days because there are not 364 days in a year right then you should be crossing that calendar off as a possibility so this is timeanddate.com about the Jewish calendar and how it all works with their leap years. It says a leap year occurs seven times in the 17 year metonic cycle with years 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17 and 19 of the cycle being leap years. This corresponds to a frequency of every two to three years. Again, our calendar doesn't work, so we have to do this. And they know that this is the reason that, or they know that it's because the calendar doesn't work. Rabbi Hillel II had to come along and create this system in order to fudge it. Using the lunar months just doesn't work. Now, this is something that people came to me with. They said, you're wrong. There is a 13th month in the scriptures and it's in the book of Ezekiel. It's when Ezekiel lies on his side for 430 uh, days, for 430 years. Ezekiel 1, 1 to 3 says, It came to be in the 30th year in the fourth Chodesh, on the fifth of the Chodesh, as I was among the exiles by the river Kavar, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of Elohim. On the fifth of the Chodesh, in the fifth year of King Yehoiachin's exile, the word of Yehovah came expressly to Yach Ezekiel, the priest Ezekiel. Okay, so in the fifth year of King Yehoiachin's exile, the word came to Ezekiel, okay? So people take this in the fifth year and they say it's the fourth Chodesh of the year. Take this and then they go on with their reading of the book of Ezekiel and they come to lie on your left side for the iniquity of the house of Israel. Shall lie on your left side 390 days, 40 days for the house of Judah, okay? And they say, okay, so that's 430 years and we began in the fifth year, the fourth Chodesh. And then they say, the next date that we get is, in the sixth year, in the sixth Chodesh. Okay, so this is a year on. It's actually 14 or 15 months if you work it out correctly. But they say this is the 13th month in Ezekiel. There has to be 13 months in order for it to be 430 days. But this is all based on a false premise. We'll look at false premises as we go on. What it actually said in Ezekiel 1 is, in the 30th year in the fourth Chodesh, and then it says, in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's exile. So when was the fifth year of his exile? It was in the 30th year, and we'll find out what it's the 30th year of in a little bit. So in the 30th year in the fourth Chodesh, the word came to Ezekiel. And then in, the, in Ezekiel 8, it says in the sixth year, in the sixth Chodesh. So there's not 13 months in between them. There's actually 24 years in between these two dates. And we can see what's going on with this in the whatever year when we go through the rest of the book of Ezekiel. In the seventh year, in the ninth year in chapter 20, in the eleventh year in chapter 26, oh, back to the tenth year in chapter 29, in the 11th year in chapter 30, in the 12th, 32, the 25th year of our exile. So by the time we get to the book, uh, the chapter 40, we find out that it's the exile that he's talking about and that's the entire context of the book. So it's the 30th year of their exile. The next date given is something that happened in the 6th year of their exile. Very actually simple to understand. There's no 13th month there. I think sometimes when people come to things that explain things that they want to believe, they don't really put much investigation into it. We're going to see other examples of that as we go on. Okay, this is TorahIsLight.org. Um, and this is about the Zadok calendar. It says, with this calendar, the year always contains precisely 364 days. Each year consists of 12 months of 30 days each, plus four additional days, one of which is intercalated at the end of each three month period. So they've got this false premise to do with the months. The months have to be 30, uh, 30 days each, and we'll look at where they get that from. So what you have to do to have 30 month days is in the third month, you have to stick in an extra day. Perfectly reasonable. Okay, but that 
another problem ends up with 364 days. Thus the first and second months are 30 days long, while the third month totals 31 days. Then the pattern repeats. New Year's Day and the first day of each three month period always fall on a Wednesday. This is another thing that they've got into their heads that needs to be the case. The year has to fall on a Wednesday. Wednesday is the day mandated as the first day by the creation. Since this heavenly light, the sun, the moon, and the stars, the basis of any calendar, were created on the fourth day. Okay, so they say it's got to be a Wednesday because that's when the sun and the moon and the stars were created. Doesn't follow. That's not a logical uh, conclusion. The great advantage of the Zadok calendar over its lunar solar uh, arrival is that it results in fixed dates for the major festivals. That's its major advantage. But that's completely irrelevant. Why would you think that it was significant that the date on the Gregorian calendar was the same if you were following the Zadok calendar? The Gregorian calendar didn't exist when the Zadok calendar came to be. So its correlation to the Gregorian calendar bears absolutely um, no significance at all. This is what a false premise is, according to Wikipedia. It's a good description. A false premise is an incorrect preposition that forms the basis of an argument. Okay, since the uh, preposition or assumption is not correct, the conclusion drawn may be an error. And of course, in this case, it does cause an error. When you think it's got to have the dates fall on the Gregorian calendar dates, and it's got to start on a Wednesday, and you think that they're these great things, and you will draw incorrect conclusions. This is where they get the 30 days in a month thing. Flood started, okay, on the 17th of the 2nd. Waters receded from the earth, and waters diminished after 150 days. On the 17th of the 7th, the ark came to a rest. So what they say is, 20, uh, the 17th of the 2nd to the 17th of the 7th, that's five months. Then they take that 150 days, and they say five months, 150 days, 30 days per month. But that doesn't logically follow. Flood started 17th of the 2nd. After 150 days, the waters diminished. And then on the 17th of the 7th, the ark came to a rest. It doesn't say that these two events happened on the same day. And in fact, just logically, if you think about it, how would the waters start to diminish and the ark come to a rest on the same day? So there's 150 days in between the 17th of the 7th and the 17th of the 2nd but not only 150 days, more than 150 days. TorahsLight.org says, we know the sun revolves on a 365.24 something circuit, right? Well, how then does the 364 day work? As with most calendars, even the Gregorian and Hillel, the second calendars, there is a need to intercalate or add days every so often to keep things aligned. You can't do that. You can't say these calendars are wrong and just like these wrong calendars, we also have to intercalate. They are no sort of authority. You don't look to the Gregorian calendar and the Hillel, the second calendar and say, well, they're intercalating. That must mean that intercalating is the right way to do it. That doesn't make sense as an argument. The same thing happens with the Zadok. The question is how? Since the Zadok calendar is a fixed day calendar, beginning with the fourth day every year, the observed equinox would advance a day or two each year. And in five to six years would be a week behind, thus the need to intercalate. No, thus the demonstration that this calendar is wrong. So how then do we determine when to add a week to keep us in line? This took a lot of investigation and mapping out the moon and sun movements. Method one that they have come up with. This is a simple method, and one that I refer to as the blind method. Sounds good so far. It completely disregards the sun and the stars, which I have a problem with, because that's what's recorded for us in Genesis 1. But as far as being simple, this is it. 
basically the method waits for the spring equinox to land on the fourth day and then it intercalates our thing a week and this gives this uh, time period between intercalations and this method is difficult to pinpoint uh, it's not difficult to pinpoint and could easily be ver verified with using only a calendar and the sun okay so one of those was given to us for the division of time the, to use a calendar as well they were, what calendar do you use you use a Gregorian calendar to do it to work out this ancient calendar that doesn't make any sense whatsoever the method two second method is a fair amount more involved it involves bringing into play the moon and its alignments with the equinoxes as well according to the book of Enoch blah 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 this is what we do Mapping out the actual observed alignments, it becomes clear that as we fall behind the spring equinox, the full moon will land seven days following the end of the previous 364 day, signaling the need to intercalate or add a week to keep us in alignment. This happens every time without fail, proving the moon is a witness, as stated in Psalm 89 and Enoch 74. Anybody else getting some red flags being waved when you're reading this? Sometimes the moon appears to do its own thing and causes an eight-year span between intercalation periods. The eight-year span between intercalation does not happen often, but if it did not happen, the distance between the start of the year and the actual equinox would widen. By using this method, we are kept very close to the equinox and the pattern of the heavenly movements fits Enoch's description perfectly. Well, the reason that it fits Enoch's, Enoch's description perfectly is because it was a description of the movement of the sun and the moon. That's all that it was. It wasn't some magical thing. It's like, wow, it fits in with Enoch. Okay, this is the Enoch calendar, Testifies of Christ by a Mr. Pratt. No comment. An unexpected feature of the 364 day year is that it results in an average length even more accurate than our modern Gregorian calendar. The actual length of the year is now 365.2422 days. The Gregorian calendar averages 365.2425 days, which is much closer than the former Julian calendar, which averaged 365.25 days. But if 52 weeks are intercalated every 293 years into the calendar of Enoch, it averages 365.2423 days which is still wrong. This is the calendar of the creator of the universe. And they're saying, whoa, look, look how much closer it is. Not what I hear when they say that. What I hear is, look how wrong it still is. And what do we have to do to make it this wrong? We have to add in every 293 years. Every 293 years. It's just insanity. It is very surprising that such accuracy can be obtained by intercalating an entire week at a time over so short a time period. Just bizarre. Enochcalendars.webs.com. The Julian calendar, now this is an absolute classic. I want you to, I want you to, when you read this, think about what they're actually suggesting here. The Julian calendar reduced each hour of the day by 9.86 seconds so that the hour has about 59 minutes and 50 seconds. The change was so subtle that the Hebrew people were unaware that this minor change could affect anything, let alone their Sabbath day. So subtle a change, we've removed 10 seconds from every hour. Do you not think somebody might have noticed 10 seconds being removed from the hour. And they, they say that it was the Julian calendar that did it. I mean, I don't even, that, that's just impossible. That could never have happened. Unless you're gonna say that what they did is they reduced the length of a second, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying it reduced it by an hour by a number of seconds. And this had some very interesting um, consequences. And I, I've had somebody come to me with something very similar than this. I'm not sure if they were talking about this exact thing, but they were talking about four minutes per day being removed from a day. And if they were actually there, it would mean that we had 365 days in, uh, 364 days in a year and not 365. So when I'm showing you this, I'm not just showing you some craziness on the internet. This is stuff that people actually believe. And again, when people come to something, that explains, explains something that they want to hold on to. 
it seems that logic and reason go out of the window. The 9.8 seconds per hour equates to almost four minutes per day. That is taken out of each of the 364 days to create the 365th. <laughs> that is March 15th. <laughs> That's the created day in case you were wondering. It's meant to go March 14th and then March 16th, but no, they've inserted March 15th. That's why our days are called side reel days, as the days have 23 hours, 56 minutes, and about five seconds. And it is not a true 24-hour day. Did anybody not notice that we uh, are not following a 24-hour day? I'd have thought it would be pretty obvious. We've all, we've all done poorly here. The following is the formula that governments use to make a sign real day. It's the government. The governments have all got together and they've created these side real days for us. Or an extra day. And it basically just takes minutes out from the original 364 days to create another day. Genius. Some mathematics. That's the, that's the formula the governments are using though, so it's pretty important for us to know. Exactly 24 hours in each of Enoch's 364 days, though. So if we were following really 24-hour days, we would end up with 364 in a year. So you can see that the extra day, the 365th, or March 15th, as it is known, does not exist. But the minutes do exist. And the Enoch calendar leaves the minutes where they belong for a 364-day year that has exactly 24 hours in each day. That, that sounds like exactly how it should be. The Gregorian calendar adds days by reducing minutes. Brilliant. I'm so glad that I've got this understanding now. Praise Yah for the internet. A side, right, okay, so this is the actual definition of a side real day. A side real day is the time between two consecutive transits of the first point of Aries. It represents the time taken by the Earth to rotate on its axis relative to the stars. It's almost four minutes shorter than the solar day because of the Earth's orbital motion. So there is a thing called a side real day. That's with the best deceptions. There's a nugget of truth embedded in all of the tat. Problem is that a side real day it's about the Earth relative to the stars rather than the Earth relative to the sun, or the stars relative to the Earth rather than the sun relative to the Earth. So it's a real thing, but obviously we don't follow side real days. We obviously follow solar days because our days are 24 hours long, and nobody has ever said ever that we follow a side real day apart from certain proponents of this calendar. The 365th created day, March 15th, is inserted into the calendar each year next to the last day of the year, which is March 16th. <laughs> why not January the 21st? Why, why are they picking on March 15th? The same procedure is followed again to create a leap day every fourth year where additional minutes are taken out of each of the original 364 days to create the 365th, uh, 66th day. They're stealing minutes from the days and making other days, which is February 29th. They got this one right, which is inserted into the Gregorian calendar at the end of the 50th week every fourth year. Problem is, okay, even if you took that to be true, you took the, our days were four minutes shorter, and then you project that out over a year. That doesn't give you 365 days. Okay, it gives you an extra 24.8 hours. So it'll give you an extra day, 0.8 hours, which wouldn't be right anyway. So it would still be wrong, even if what they were saying was correct. But if you followed the side real day, if you said we follow the side real day, what the consequence of that actually would be is a 366 day, not going back to 364. So, with all of that nonsense out of the way, and these are all the things that people suggest is that, you know, this is actually the true calendar. What we need is a calendar that doesn't have the need for something that sounds fancy and it's all twisty and turny and you're reading it going, what are they actually trying to say? 
Maybe they're right. This sounds like the most ridiculously complicated thing ever. Maybe I'm just too stupid to understand it. We need something that doesn't have intercalation in. We need a calendar that gives us 365.2422 days every year. Exactly that. No more, no less. You know, you could have it out to a billion decimal points, point one, and it would still be wrong. You need something that gives you exactly that long as a year, because that's how long a year is. So the calendar has to reflect how long a year is. So what determines a chodesh? This is the big question. In the year, we've got these things called chodeshim, which is the plural of a chodesh. And in English, the closest word that we've got to it is month. Okay? It's, it's fine for us to use the word month to refer to a chodesh, because it's the English word for that. So what determines a month? Well, a month, people will say, is determined by the moon. There's a problem with that. A lunar month is 29.53 days. 29.53 times 12 is 354.36, hence the need to intercalate the 13th month. Using the moon to determine the Chodeshim means we have to create a 13th month without scriptural instruction as to how to do it, and without a 13th month ever being mentioned in scripture, especially in the book of Ezekiel. The sun, the moon, and the stars were given to us for the reckoning of time, and we've ruled out the moon. Okay, the new moon, giving us a month, that's not something that can be because it doesn't give us 365.2422 days. If it did, that would be great. It doesn't. We're left with the sun and the stars. With the sun and the stars, the stars divide up the year perfectly into 12. Okay? Only the sun's position as it travels on its circuit through the stars gives us 12 distinct periods that you can look at the sun, moon, and stars and say, well, where are we at? Okay, this divides it up into 12, the perfectly comprise of one year. The movement of the sun through the constellations, in fact, is intrinsic to the concept of a year. In other words, a year is how long it takes the sun to move through the 12 constellations. Every year, that's, that's a year. So what do we use to determine the year and divide it into 12? We use the constellations. Now, people have a problem with using the constellations. They've got all of these associations with the zodiac. All the zodiac is, is people coming along and looking at these ancient systems of knowledge and ascribing their own uh, meaning to it. If you're born in this Chodesh, then it means this. If you go back and look at ancient cultures, it's amazing their understanding of the stars. The Hebrews had something that they called the Ma'atzerot. Ma'atzerot, and that was the 12 constellations. But every ancient culture had their understanding of these 12 constellations. And not only that, but the 12 constellations have all got these things called deacons, okay, which um, are other constellations nearby to these main constellations. And the amazing thing about that is every single one of those cultures has the same story attached to the meaning of the deacons and the meaning of the constellations. Even though if you look at the constellations, you might just see a squiggle in the sky. You think, well, if they were coming to their understanding of what they meant, how would they all come to the same story? And the story that they all come to is the story of Yeshua. The story is of a price that could not be paid and then someone coming along and paying the price. That's one of the stories of one of the constellations anyway. And all of them tell the, the story of redemption. And all of these ancient cultures had these same stories, okay? And the Hebrews, which would be the root source of this, had the Ma'atzeroth. And it's always these 12 constellations. So if we want something that makes exactly a year, we use the Ma'atzeroth or the constellations. And that will not require any intercalation ever because it's impossible for the sun to take any longer because it's going on a circuit through those 12 things. You can't take it any longer on a circuit through a fixed thing because then you've just gone into the first one again. Isaiah 47.13 links the stars with the Chodeshim directly. 
says, you are exhausted by your many counsels. Let the astrologers, the stargazers, and those who prognosticate by the chudashim. Okay, the astrologers and the stargazers, what are they doing? They're prognosticating by the stars. Stars, stars, stars. Okay, let them stand up and save you from what is coming upon you. Second Kings 23, 4 to 5. It says, then the king commanded Hilkiahu, the high priest, and the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of Yehovah all the objects that were made for Baal and for Asherah and for all the hosts of the heavens. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kedron, and they took their ashes to Bethel. This is exactly what uh, Charlie was talking about last week with the Baal and the Ashtaroth worship that was happening in order to worship Yehovah. And he put down the black robed priests whom the kings of Yehudah had appointed to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Yehudah and in the places all around Jerusalem. And those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, and to the mazalah. And this word mazalah is related in Hebrew to the word mazarot. Okay, it's the constellations. In fact, in the Septuagint version, they don't try to translate mazarot. And they don't try to translate mazala. What they do is they put in a transliteration, which is in Greek, what the Hebrew sounds like, of matzarot. It just says matzarot in both places in the Septuagint. Okay, so if we look at the entry in Gazenius's uh, Hebrew Chaldee lexicon for what this means, we'll see that this understanding that the sun in each of the months was in a different constellation is right there. Okay, this is his Hebrew Chaldee lexicon. He says that the word means lodging places or inns. The Hebrews gave this name to the 12 signs of the zodiac called in Arabic uh, the circle of palaces. These were imagined to be lodging places of the sun during the 12 months. So they had this understanding. And in fact, our best understanding of what the stars uh, the story that the stars tell us doesn't come from Hebrew because we've lost the Hebrew names for the Matzeroth. It comes from Arabic, which is very closely related to Hebrew. And in Arabic, it tells the exact story of Yeshua. Um, I've had the book recommended to me a number of times since the last calendar teaching called E.W. Bullinger's uh, The Witness of the Stars. Um, it's not something I've had any time to look at in detail, but um, when I did the search for uh, Maseroth, I came up with a Chuck Misler video where he was talking about the Maseroth, and he goes into all of these things. He goes into E.W. Bullinger and the Arabic, and uh, it's quite an interesting little short video to watch. But all of these ancient cultures have these names and this exact same story, and it comes from a root and the Hebrews had this understanding, and their understanding was that the sun lodged in each one of the constellations during each one of the 12 months, that they are essentially the Chodeshim, or that they dictate the Chodeshim. And that's right there for you if you want to go uh, look on Blue Letter Bible, Second Kings 23, verse 5. You're looking for this word translated as constellations or Mazalah, and that is the understanding that the Hebrews had. This, um, this calendar, which is on the floor of a sixth century synagogue, I said last time when I brought it up, I said I've not had time to translate um, all of these, but Ashley translated them, and they mean the same things as every culture has the understanding of. They're all pretty much the same. Like this one, I believe, is Archer. And we'll see Philo when he refers to these things. He talks about the constellation of the ram. And when you look at these constellations, they don't necessarily look like what people have understood them as. But again, these are matzerot. These are in line with the understandings that we can see and understand the meaning of in Arabic. Psalm 19, 1 to 6 says, The heavens are proclaiming the esteem of ale and the firmament is declaring the work of his hand. This word proclaiming here, safar, what it means is to recount. Like if you recounted an account of something 
to somebody. It's saying that they're recounting his esteem or his glory. The firmament is declaring the work of his hand and that's exactly what they do. They tell us this story of redemption. Day to day pours forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and that means a measuring line. And their words to the end of the, end of the world in them, he sets up a tent for the sun. Okay? It's this, um, this circuit for the sun, as it will call it in a second. And it is like a bridegroom coming out of its room. Uh, it rejoices like a strong man to run the path through the 12 constellations. It's going forth is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end. And naught is hidden from its heat. This word circuit, this is something that people kind of get caught up on. They uh, say that it means equinox because they read things like at the turning of the year. And we understand in English the turning of the year to be the equinox. It's when, you know, you start to uh, get um, lighter or darker days, basically. So we understand it as the turning of the year. But what it actually means is a turning on a circuit and I went through that in the video last time if people want more details but this does not mean equinox it wouldn't it wouldn't even matter if it did mean equinox but just to make the point it's turning on a circuit it's revolving like that it's not turning from one thing to another it cannot mean that so this is the video for anyone who's watching online. If you've not seen like the in-depth explanation which goes into the moon and how that fits into all of these things, goes into the equinox in detail, goes into more about the Chodeshim and more scriptures, I would recommend that people watch this. I've had people um, write emails and they say, it was only on the fourth or fifth time that we watched this that it clicked and we got it. Because when I received this information, it was... It was in response to prayer, to questions that I had. So I understood how these chunks all fitted in as I was giving them. But the first time that you hear something like this, you're like, well, okay, now that I've heard it once, maybe the chunks will fit in better the next time that I hear it, and then maybe the next time, the next time. So I'd, I'd recommend that people uh, watch this if it's not making sense. Okay, the equinox then. People have asked, why is the equinox after the beginning of the first Chodesh? Because people have in their heads that the equinox is the beginning of the year. The equinox does not mark the beginning of anything and using it to begin the year is not found in scripture. You'll never find an instruction in the scriptures that tells you to begin the year at the equinox. And it doesn't mark the beginning of anything. Okay, if you think it, it marks the beginning of the year, it should mark the beginning of 12 somethings. People have suggested that maybe we take the year and we divide it up equally into 12 starting at the equinox. But again, that's not scriptural. It's like a guess. It's like saying the calendar doesn't work if you start with the equinox. What should we do? We'll arbitrarily cut this 365 point whatever year up into bits. What we should have is the beginning of the year being followed by 12 periods that return back to the beginning, which is what you get if you start with the sun entering into a chodesh. And we'll get into how we know which, which chodesh as we go on. If you use the equinox to mark the beginning of the year, then what do you count to? Okay, you can't use simultaneously the stars and the equinox, which is... Uh, what someone said to me, they, were, they said, well, it's pretty obvious. There's two equinoxes in a year and there's two seasons of festivals. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following with you there. And they said, well, I, was, I was tracking with you while you were using the stars for the Chodesh, but you're not starting it with the equinox. You can't start it with the equinox because the equinox moves through the Chodesh, it moves one day approximately every generation. So every generation, the equinox would be a day before. And it continues like that. It's called the procession of the equinox. So at one point, it would have started the correct Chodesh. Well, it, it, 
at no point in scripture are we told to use the equinox to mark the beginning of the year. The equinox has a very important function, which I'll get onto, and it is something that points us to feast times. People have become fascinated with the idea that the most simple of men could keep track of time using just the stick. But that's not scriptural. Using a stick to find the equinox is not scriptural. You never find that instruction anywhere. And people have become fascinated more with the idea that it's got to be something that could be done by the most simple of men. But that's, you know, it's kind of like a romantic notion. But it's, it's not actually true. Okay. If you think about the situation that the Israelites were in, living in Israel, they, when they wanted to know something from the scriptures, they went to the Levites. Nobody had their own copy of the scriptures. There was nobody sitting at home going, that's the calendar then. That was not a thing. So the idea that they could find then the equinox with the stick and they'd know where to go from there, it's just it's not actually the reality of what would have been happening in Israel at the time. They would go to the Levites and the Levites would guide them in the feasts and all of those sort of things. Doing it with a stick is not scriptural either. If you introduce some kind of technology to find out the calendar, then that's not correct. Okay, you can use technology like we can use it to know when the sun's entering into the Chodesh, but if that is your means of determining it, and it's not the sun, moon, and the stars, then it means that that's wrong. And a stick is a piece of technology when you use it in that way. Psalm 104 verse 19 says, he made the moon for appointed times. And when I first did the calendar video saying it's to do with the, um, the constellations, people sent me this verse, rightfully, you know, the really good verse, the, the moon is for the Moedim. So what we need to know is how is the moon for the Moedim? Because we know it can't be for the division of time. So how do we use the moon for the Moedim? But the bit of it that people um, don't reckon with is the moon he made for appointed times, the sun knows it's going down. You just kind of read that and go, oh, we don't know what that means. Probably not important. Very important. He made the moon for appointed times. The sun knows it's going down. And the reason that this is important is to show us how, or an artifact of the fact that you can find out when the equinox is without using a stick. You can know the day of the equinox simply by looking at the movements of the heavenly bodies. This is stellarium, okay? This is the sun here. And what we're gonna see is the sun is going to come down and it's going to go down above this bush. Little bushes here, big bush here, this middle bush. I'll just play it so you can see this bit of it anyway, okay? You can download this piece of software and you can use it, it's free. And you can use this to track the heavenly bodies. Okay, so the sun goes down. Now what you're going to see, and you've got to remember when you're looking at this and when you see the other examples, when the sun's in the sky, you see it's got like a nighttime background to it here. So you can see the constellations. But when the sun's in the sky, you can't actually see the constellations. That'll be important. We see the sun going down here. And as it continues with the day, what we're gonna see is the moon come overhead and the moon is gonna go down in exactly the same place. During this time of the day, when the moon's in the sky, you would be able to see the constellations. Okay, so here it is. And the moon will follow the exact same path across the sky on the day of the equinox alone as the sun did. Okay, and what we're expecting is for it to go down behind this bush here. And there you go, that's how you know the day of the equinox, when that happens. You don't need the stick or anything. See, the equinox is important, but it doesn't mark the beginning of anything. I'll show you why the equinox is important. Okay, when I first looked at the dates of the horoscopes, um, if you remember when I first did that first video, 
I said that I've been looking into this. And then when I looked at the date of the horoscopes, uh, <coughs> I was like, the equinox is the first thing. And then all of the uh, dates follow on from it. And then the same with the autumnal equinox. Problem is, as I said, that's not true. That's true on the horoscope reckoning of times, but it's not true on an astronomical reckoning of time. When we look at the sky, it's no longer true. The equinox moves through throughout the constellations. This is what Philo says. It says, the sun too, the, the great lord of the day, bringing about two equinoxes each year in spring and autumn. And we looked last time at how there is no spring and autumn. There's the hot part of the year and the cold part of the year, and they're punctuated by harvests and the planting of seeds and the former rains and the latter rains and all of those sort of things are how they reckon their calendar. Okay, the spring equinox in the constellation of the ram. Again, they all have these similar names. And the autumn equinox in that of the scales, we call it Libra, but we recognize that it is scales, supplies very clear evidence of the sacred dignity of the seventh number. And basically what he's saying is that they're seven months apart from each other. First month, you've got six months, and then the next one's the seventh month, and then that cycle repeats. He says, enduring them, there is enjoined by law the keeping of the greatest national festivals, since at both of them all the fruits of the earth ripen. This is the key. Why is he saying that the festivals are at that time of year? He says, because that's when the fruits of the earth ripen. And that's the important thing, because we're told... Yehovah said to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf, the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. So the feast of first fruits has to happen after the crops are ripe. Okay, and in fact, if we think about it, not only after the crops are ripe, but after they've harvested their crops and gone up to Jerusalem, with the crops. Maybe it's the crops local to Jerusalem. We're not actually sure. The point being, the crops have to be ripe. So the function of the equinox, or the significance that we can see of the equinox, is that it tells us when things are going to be ripe. It doesn't mark the beginning of the year. You're not going to find it in scripture as start the year from here. But it does tell you the time of the year that things are going to be ripe. In Leviticus 23.39, on the 15th day of the seventh Chodesh, when you gather in the fruit of the land. So again, they're having a harvest here. What this is telling us is the fruit of the land has to be ripe at this time. So this has to be after the equinox. It has to be after the equinox. Not because the equinox is told to us to be significant, but because we know that it, it, uh, it's from that point that the crops get ripe. That's just what the equinox shows us. So nothing starts with the equinox, but we do know that the crops get ripe by it. Here's Josephus. Upon the 15th day of the same month, when the season of the year is changing for winter, in other words, when it's changing for the cold time, when does the season of the year change for winter? After the equinox. So which is the first Chodesh? If we know that the equinox shows us when the crops get ripe, how are we actually determining what is the first Chodesh? Which Chodesh begins the year? Since the equinox moves through the constellations, how do we know which constellation to begin with? This is one of the very excellent questions that was sent in. Calendars using lunar months generally start the year on the next new moon after the equinox. Okay, so you wait for the equinox, then it's the next new moon. None of that is scriptural, incidentally. If you start with the next constellation, however, the crops might ripen and be ready for the harvest in the Chodesh before. So to show you that visually, okay? Let's just pretend that each one of these are the days of the Chodesh and not the days of these pagan name months. If the equinox is here, okay? The Chodesh started here. The next Chodesh starts here. If the crops ripen here, then you're going to have all of this time and then 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 days until you're presenting the first fruits of the harvest and you're not allowed to eat of the harvest until you've presented the first fruits. So this presents a problem. This, this is something that we need to reckon. This Chodesh, this year, the equinox did start very early in the Chodesh. So what I can give to you 
is the system by which this works. The 12 Chodesh, okay, the 12 constellations. But as to whether we're to wait for this one, all I can say to you is, it's not found in scripture. You'll never find that instruction anywhere. All you'll actually find is, you need to wait until the crops are ripe, which is exactly what we're doing. Okay. I can show you the calendar, show you how it's meant to work. The actual implementation of the calendar though, all I can tell you is, if we did wait for this, it wouldn't be from scripture and it wouldn't produce the right result. So to me, that's not correct. To me, this is the Chodesh. If the equinox is here and the equinox only points us to when things get ripe, this is the correct Chodesh because this is when it ripens and then you have first fruits kind of around here. Okay, if that makes sense. Okay, if the equinox was here and then the Chodesh started here, the ripening might be here, but that doesn't mean that waiting for the next Chodesh is right. It only works in that case. If it's here, Chodesh starts here, and the next one there, ripens here, it's not gonna produce the right result. Hope that makes sense now, now that you can see it visually and it's not just something that exists in my own head. So how to know when a Chodesh starts? Okay, because if we're going to say it's when the sun enters into a constellation, how do we actually know when the sun enters into a constellation? So how to know? In the age of the internet and instant access to information, we've become accustomed to having the ability to immediately orientate ourselves and our knowledge of a matter. Okay, that's just what we're used to, isn't it? And they're, the, they're people's expectations that we should be able to go, what's the situation? Look out the window. Oh, there it is, it's in that Chodesh. Well, that's not how things worked in the ancient world. Praise Yehovah that we can actually use the technology that we've got to know precisely when the sun enters into a Chodesh. Our understanding accords with the understanding of the ancients. In our modern society, we've lost touch with the movements of heavenly bodies. They lived outside. They would have seen the sun rise in the morning, which we're gonna see why that's significant. And they would have seen the sun set and they would be familiar with how everything was moving above them. They wouldn't have the pollution of the city lights, the light pollution, and they would have been able to see all these things. And if you can imagine day after day after day, you'd see these things very gradually happening in the skies and you'd know exactly what was happening. We don't have that. We have the internet though, so we can say, okay, this time, that's when the sun enters the Chodesh. We can rely on that, and it's the same information that they had in the past that they reckoned by very difficult means. And I'm in total agreement that it would be better for us if we did familiarize ourselves with the movement of the heavenly bodies, but we don't actually have to at the moment. We can know precisely when it happens. The ancients knew these things very precisely, and we now have the task of reacquainting ourselves with their methods. What I would suggest to people is that you watch the movement of the heavenly bodies. We know what they're there to tell us. Let's look at them and see these things so that maybe if we're ever stuck out in the wilderness, we can track time. For us though, we've got the internet. It accords with the ancients' knowledge. We can find out exactly when it happens down to the second. So praise Jehovah for that. In the time that he knew that we weren't gonna be following the stars anymore. He's given us the perfect tool to know. Okay, so this is why sunrise and sunset are important to know where the sun is in the constellations. Like I said, if you look at the sky in the daytime, you can see the sun, but you can't see the constellations. If you look at the sky in the nighttime, you can see the constellations, but you can't see the sun. So how do you know? Well, again, I recommend people download Stellarium and you can actually watch how these things take place. You can get a much better reckoning of the sky and then maybe go out and start looking at what's actually happening. Okay, so this is just before sunrise. Oh, and here, what do we see? This is the constellation Pisces. This is just before the sun comes up, Pisces would travel across the sky. Then we would have the sun come up, and when the sun comes up, we can't see the constellation. 
So what we have to do once the sun has come up, and this is on its transit between Pisces and Aries, once the sun has come up, we need to wait for the sun to go down and we need to see how the sun has changed position or how the constellations have changed and exactly where they are. And then when you track that over time, you can see the movement of these constellations and you can know precisely when these things happen. Okay, so now this is sunset. At this point, you're still not able to see the constellations. You wouldn't be able to see that it's coming out of Pisces, but you would know that you'd seen Pisces before it came up, immediately before. And then when the sun had set, you'd be able to see Aries here. Okay, so if you're tracking that day by day, then it makes perfect sense. If you've got this kind of modern day understanding of things of, oh, we must have this information right now. Tell me, where is the sun? What constellation is the sun in? We must be able to find out immediately. Then. We've got the tool to do that, but you can't do it just by looking at the sky. To do that, you need to be tracking it day and night over periods of time. They would have been doing it year in, year out. Here is the, um, the transit into the seventh Chodesh. Okay, just before the sun comes up. Leo, that's the constellation at the moment, the sun comes up. You won't be able to see the constellations anymore. Now you have to wait until the night time. We can see that it's going into Virgo, but you won't be able to see that. Okay, so you wait for the night time. Sun's coming down, and then once it's down, you can see what part of the constellation is visible. And this is like a moving picture that you would get every night. It's gradual movement. And over time, over days, over years, the picture would build in your head and you'd understand it intimately. It's a problem, it is a problem that we don't have that understanding. We can get it if people can be bothered. Get up in the morning, go to the sunset, see what constellation is visible. Go to a place where there's no light pollution and find out. That's how it worked for them. That's how we would have to do it. But as I say, for all of that is a bit too much trouble. Get your phone out and you can find out precisely. First Samuel 20 verse 5 shows us that they knew these movements intimately. David said to Jehonathan, see, tomorrow is the Chodesh. Once you know the Chodesh, you know the length of time that it takes for the sun to travel through a constellation. You've do been doing it for a couple of years. Then you know you can project the calendar out an awful long way. It's not just to the next day. But you know the length that these Chodeshim take. So, oh, it's the first of the Chodesh now. So this Chodesh takes this long, and then we can know when this one's going to be. You could project it out and know the feasts months and months in advance. And of course, we can see by this, they did know the precise time that this happened. This is another way that you can know what the Chodesh is. For people who have seen this, everyone here has seen it, I think. Um, this was included at the end of one of the parts of a Torah portion that went out on a live stream, but it never uh, got put into the video. So we know that the sun is in a Chodesh, but the moon also travels through the Chodeshim. But it takes a much shorter amount of time to transit from one to another, about two or three days. Along the bottom, this color-coded bar here, each one of these different colors is the Chodesh that the sun is in, okay? So for each one of these bars, the sun's in that Chodesh. You see this wavy line going up and down? You see that from that distance? That is the that's the moon, okay? That is full moon to new moon, okay? You track the movement to the moon. From full moon to new moon, on the date of the new moon, see all the color-coded bars? They correspond to these chodeshim as well. So when the sun is in this chodeshim, on the new moon, the moon will be in the chodeshim as well. So you can't see the sun 
and what constellation the sun's in during the night, but you can see the moon during the night and you can see the constellations during the night. So this is like a second witness as to which Chodeshim you're at at any point in time. You just wait for the new moon and look at what constellation the moon's in and you know that's what the Chodesh is currently. But as I say, they'd be tracking these things over much greater periods of time and they would know these things intimately as we can see evidence that they did. Come back in the, th the third part and actually get into the feasts because they should make more sense now. When I'm saying things like the first Chodesh and the seventh Chodesh, now you know what that is and how it's dictated. But, um, and if people were watching at the beginning of the live stream, uh, they'll be aware because there's just so many questions about this and because it's such a, a crazy, crazy um, subject matter. Um, I want to give the opportunity for people online to ask any questions that they've got. So if you're watching it and you're on YouTube, now you go over and watch it on YouTube, and you refresh your browser, you press the little circle with the arrow on at the top of your browser, you refresh that, then the live chat will pop up. We don't usually have live chat on because in my experience, when people have um, like an open chat forum and the Torah keepers, all of these sort of craziness uh, aspects all come into it and everyone's just talking to each other instead of listening to the video and they're teaching each other nonsense. And it's just, it's never been a good thing in my experience. So we don't have the live chat on. But if people refresh now, the live chat will appear and you can ask questions. And Ashley's in the back room and she will tell me if there's any questions um, and then I'll do my best to answer them. We'll see where we're at. No questions yet. Okay, I'll give it 20 seconds so that we're not just sitting here. <laughs> Hopefully nobody's got any questions. That would be brilliant, wouldn't it? I don't think anyone's going to ask any questions. They'll be ready to fire off the questions. What's that, sorry? Time lapse, that's true. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll wait until it's <laughs> until it displays on your phone then, and then we'll. What's the question? Is the location of what? Yeah, yeah, I get, I get the question. Okay, so if you're in a different place in the world, it's going to work differently than if you're in Israel. And that is another one of the great things about this calendar. It works anywhere in the world. In fact, any of the calendars will work any, anywhere in the world because you reckon the time by the sun, the moon, and the stars. They look different in different areas, but the time is different in those places. You know, in some places, it's going to be daytime. In some places, it's going to be nighttime. We don't say... Is it day or night in Israel? Because we must reckon day or night by Israeli time. It's got no relevance to us. We can reckon the time wherever we are in the world. Do we have any more? Okay, so when you're looking online, the dates that you'll find for when the sun enters into the constellations, you've got to make sure that you're using an astronomical website. Um, the astrological dates are all uh, vastly different and they've never actually changed. Um, but as to when the sun's gonna enter into a constellation, look up astronomy as the, uh, the Google term that you search with. Or just use our calendar on the way biblicalfellowship.com. <laughs> Yeah. Well, all I can say is the ancients were all in agreement over it. They were very precise in their understanding. I don't have this astronomical understanding. Um, but if you were tracking these things moving through the sky, the middle point of them is actually 
um, something that is discernible. They were all in agreement over it. So we can either look to their understanding of when those things happen, or we can look to the actual mathematical precise, when does it actually transit from one to the other um, exactly. And that actually agrees with what they knew as well. So all a bit mysterious how they knew it, but we do know what they knew. Uh, so we can reliably, I would say, go off that. Good question. If the equinox is in the middle of the Chodesh, they would have been intimately familiar with how long crops took to ripen. I went through the moon as well in the teaching and uh, the significance of things like the barley moon and the harvest moon. They would tell them when the harvests were going to be. So all of that ancient understanding that surrounds it is important for us to reacquaint ourselves with. What I do know is this is the system by which we do it. And I also know that it's going to be a long, long time until the equinox is in the middle of the Chodesh. So it's not going to be a problem for us. Um, but it's a good question. These are questions that I have as well. I don't really understand the question. I don't know what the Jerusalem location is. Um, unless it's asking the same thing about do we reckon it by Jerusalem time and what's going on in Jerusalem. But again, the same example, we don't reckon day and night off what day and night, whether it's day and night in Jerusalem. We don't reckon our dates off what data is in Jerusalem. We've got our own systems of time and it changes around the world. The movements of the heavenly bodies are different around the world so that we can use that system in those various places. Maybe I've misunderstood the question. If you want to explain what Jerusalem location is, then I'll have another stab. Where in the scriptures would they go so that they could see the information? The seasons and the times? Correctly. Um, what we're going to go over in the third part, uh, Leviticus 23, there's also Deuteronomy 16, Exodus 34, Exodus 12, specifically for the Passover and unleavened bread. Um, yeah, they, they go to the Torah commandments about the feasts and what the times were. But like I say, nobody had their own copy of the scriptures. If they wanted to know this information, they would have gone to the priests to find out, or they would have gone to their local Levite and they would have found out what that information was. Um, the idea that they would have had to have been able to determine these things from the scriptures is based on a false premise. That false premise being that they would have had the scriptures. different to what they were last year. Last year, we were going off the astrological dates. That was before understanding the reckoning of the equinox and all of those things. That was back when I thought that the equinox started uh, the Chodeshim. I think that that's what the difference that they're talking about is. Uh, the length of the Chodeshim should always be the same though. Um, just when you start the Chodeshim is different with the astrological dates to the actual observed astronomical ones. For a generation, the someone asked, are the dates for the feast days the same for a, every year? For a generation, uh, they would be for at least a generation actually until the equinox moved to such a point where the crops were going to ripen in a different Chodesh. Um, so for a long time, yes, they are. Um, but eventually it would change when the crops ripened in a different Chodeshim. I 
think that's just more of a scriptural question. If you write me an email at light in underscore the dark at hotmail.com, I'll answer your question. Um, but if we just stick to calendar questions so that it doesn't just go on forever. I believe it was, yeah. I was, um, I was kind of following Nehemia Gordon and uh, Michael Rood, what they were doing, and I believe it was. But we can find out all this information and check out these things and see what would have been the correct dates. Um, but yes. It's the last one. Okay, cool.